everyone, this is update for November 13, 2022, day 263 of the war and of the date update. So today mostly uh, sort of general uh, topic, strategic news. <clears throat> let's just start with uh, Russia and uh, let's see how they are, let's say, improving their war effort or trying to. So uh, there is news today that um, Kalashnikov company, basically it's a company that produces uh, AKs uh, <clears throat> and it's uh, so it's kind of like become a, like huge large sort of corporation I would say even. Uh, so now it's going to be uh, the news goes that it's going to be coordinator of all suppliers of weapons to Russian Ministry of Defense. Uh, what this really means is this is extreme centralization of the supply of all sort of systems and weapons uh, and it actually would that's the next step from all of this a uh, that it's actually going to backfire and situation is going to get worse that's the first thing and there will be tremendous corruption uh, to get basically a clashing of this corporation become like a gatekeeper with huge um, opportunity for corruption and you know in Russia or in Ukraine where corruption sort of goes very easily uh, this is going to happen and basically it's this whole centralization is actually uh, the worst thing you can do in order to have a supply or basically if you want to um, you know derail the whole idea of supplying uh, weapons to Minister of Defense um, that's what you actually would do so but um, uh, you would not be probably long uh, long term viewers would not be surprised uh, to learn that Ukraine does the same thing. So basically, um, government uh, actually Minister of Defense came out today and said that government will take over some of the companies uh, in the defense space in order to create one huge government run conglomerate, which already is there, which does not produce anything. Complete failure, complete corruption. So. Um, Again, both countries are the same sort of Soviet systems uh, that sort of act the same, completely incompetent. And uh, they, as I said before, they go going to their 1917 moments. Uh, just who, who gets there faster, uh, who knows. But they definitely, uh, they will not be able to exist in the current form the way they exist. And uh, unfortunately, it's going to happen in, uh, say, brutal way, and not in a sort of, not in the, not through the peaceful reforms, but through blood and sweat. Um, then, uh, since we're talking about uh, Ukraine, uh, so just a little bit on the uh, information on the capital of uh, of Ukraine, Kiev. So the city is actually. Is, it has been slowly dying since all of these problems of, with electricity supply where people don't have electricity for 8 to 10 uh, hours per day and it's random, there's no predictability, uh, sometimes even for 12 hours. <clears throat> so you obviously, as I said, you, you cannot do anything, you know, you cannot live normal life, you cannot have any business, anything. So as a result, uh, there's um, uh, exodus of people uh, from Kyiv, they moving to the villages more to the west to basically you know to all of this area probably some of them will start moving to uh, Europe as refugees and as a result uh, the real estate market essentially non-existent prices are in free fall and um, reports are that uh, prices for the apartments which is sort of standard sort of like way of life in in, in sort of former Soviet uh, cities uh, they down 70 to 80 percent essentially so this is uh you know <laughs> that situation when when they say there is a blood on the street that's when you buy <laughs> so uh, but i don't think anyone <laughs> there is enough brave people to do that uh, even the that's what the sort of if you follow that instruction that's probably what should make you extremely um, rich uh, then uh let's actually switch back to russia and what's going on uh so russian large corporations uh, they they started tapping chinese uh, financial markets so they actively borrowing there and so far they bore, borrowing plus minus five billion u.s uh, u.s dollar equivalent in chinese yuan uh 
yuan uh, and equivalent is about five billion dollars so basically um, it's not perfect but uh, it looks like uh, Russia is able to um, to switch financing to, to China uh, then uh, there is another news uh, in Russia this time the head of the Wagner group uh, Evgeny Prigozhin uh, accused um, St. Petersburg governor uh, that he is a spy working for I don't know who he for for foreign sort of intelligence agencies and so forth, basically spy traitor and so on so he asked um, uh, local you know KGB well FSB formally it's known as F, uh, as FSB but it's always uh, KGB just uh, it has million masks uh, so uh, basically he he said that he needs to they need to check him because he's a traitor so what this really means is that um, first of all it's um, in a way it's it's a very unusual move and uh, in a way, also, it, he's taking authority that he does not have uh, onto himself. Uh, in in some ways, he's basically challenging uh, Russian top Russian president um, by doing all of these things. Uh, this also tells us that there is quite a bit of tension within the Russian political top. And um, as you can see, cracks start to appear. Um, there is, there are, um, and uh, when I say that both countries are going to their 1917 moments, uh, there are a lot of reports of, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, better mutiny among these mobilized soldiers where they don't get any anything or they, you know, they, they left in the, in the field with no supplies and so on. Um, and they tend to or argue very aggressively with the officers um, and so far it still remains under control but it flares up here and there from time to time uh, and that's actually how 1917 started uh, in the former Russian Empire uh, when you know eventually the soldiers will probably select their own officers and they start they will start acting uh, and this is how basically civil war start as well uh which because 1917 just for those who are not very familiar it's basically start of the civil war in the russian empire um so that's uh, the situation on sort of inside of ukraine russia where are they all going um then let's actually switch to europe and let's look what's going on there with uh, gas storage which is claimed uh, that it's uh, full and it's such a wonderful news, great achievement and so on. Uh, formally, it's at 95%. The problem with all of that is, um, you know, percentages, they are relative numbers, right? <clears throat> you always want to know both absolute numbers and relative numbers. So as you can see, there is a very clever spin when, okay, everything is okay, we're at 95%. The problem is 95% really means uh, 103 bil uh, uh, yeah, um, billion cubic meters of natural gas. If you remember, um, the uh, European market is about, I think, 400 um, billion cubic meters. And, and Russia was supplying out of that 200, right? So supplies from Russia essentially like dwindled I uh, don't remember what's right now is like 18 20 30 um, billion cubic meters so basically non-existent so you can see, as you can see out of 200 okay Europe has half so it's not really 95 it's really just half right so that really means that there will be significant challenges uh, in Europe um, even though this and this is all of this was supplied via LNG sort of uh, uh, route, right? So mostly from the US. So A, it's extremely expensive. Uh, B, it's only half of what is needed. And obviously there won't be, you know, all of the 200. 
because prices are too high and the way to high prices basically kill industry as we discussed before in Europe so they that you know they cannot pay this um, uh, extremely high prices so again then we go back to this okay so what's the situation what's the solution for this um, a solution is uh, to return back to uh, conventional energy and until that happens this sort of limbo in Europe will persist the inflation will remain high and and Europe will be going deeper and deeper into uh, economic self-destruction uh, until there is enough of the civil unrest that essentially it, that you know if this is not going to get resolved through normal paths through the elections and so on eventually civil unrest will sort of take care of this this is a similar situation to what's going on in its nature in ukraine and russia where uh, there is no sort of changes at from the top which is in both countries extremely corrupt and sort of basically views both countries as sort of plantation to exploit um, or slave plantations to exploit uh, and they have no desire to change so eventually this will be sort of taken you know nature will take care of it it's just going to be un unfortunately in a very brutal way so the same situation kind of like uh, in some ways in uh, Europe um, in US situation is not as bad just because um, let's say US didn't go as far as Europe fighting conventional uh, energy production it, it's definitely did a lot and that's why you know there are problems in the US but they just not as deep and you know US is obviously naturally gifted by tremendous energy um, resources similar to Canada uh, and similar to uh, to Russia so that also kind of creates a better situation overall it's not perfect but it's it, it's just relative on relative scale it is better uh, then uh, talking about this energy so Pakistan openly already said that it's not going to support this price ceilings that's a that um, West is trying to implement uh, on the Russian crude oil and just for, for everyone's understanding crude oil is extremely liquid uh, commodity it's almost like gold it's like like as if it's like think of it as a cash because everybody needs it you can sell it anywhere so again this clearly says that there is a rift between the west and developing world that it's not going to support this um ceiling on the russian crude and you know obviously the whole Russian flow of Russian uh, crude oil will simply go will go to India, Pakistan, whoever else needs China, obviously, uh, anyone else. They they obviously will have to have the discount. Uh, at the same time, um, the cost of producing crude in Russia is in Russia is very low, so the margin is still big and huge. Probably not enough relative to what's going on in Russia in terms of the expenses uh, on this war but it still means that there is significant supply of sort of fresh blood into russian economy into russian system and it's not gonna stop and as i mentioned before russia was quietly buying like old tankers uh so that it will have its own fleet of tankers um and so it can basically trans they they then they can avoid this uh boycott uh the, from the so more independent uh, vessel owners uh, that's being implemented through the marine insurance as everybody knows uh, i spoke about that uh, so basically they will just simply buy they they already bought and i don't know how much more they will if they still buying or it's all 100 percent ready but basically they, they've essentially created their own fleet of tankers uh, that they're gonna use to supply oil to whoever else in the world needs it um so again yes it's going to be it's not going to be simple there is a lot of you know moving part there's a lot of managerial talent you need to manage this whole complicated systems uh but in the same, at the same time the the system will function yes it's going to be you know less profitable and so on but it's still gonna work uh and sort of there won't be um 
uh, sort of problem. Uh, just a quick update on uh, China, Chinese president. I mentioned before that he's planning to visit Saudi Arabia and probably the entire of the Persian Gulf uh, with the whole idea of convincing them sort of to be neutral uh, in the future uh, potential will still stay say potential uh, confront because there's still hope that it's gonna go it's not gonna happen in the future confrontation uh, over Taiwan and given that Saudi Arabia has extremely bad relationship with, uh, with current US administration uh, there is good chance that that may happen especially if it's gonna be guaranteed uh, sort of peace from Iran right because iran is kind of like its rival in the region so if china manages and, and russia manages to sort of uh, reign in iran uh, then there is high chance that saudi arabia will be willing to sort of be neutral uh, uh, with respect to, to to chinese actions there um, that's uh, that's all in terms of important strategic news let's actually switch to the uh, to ukraine so situation with the uh, energy distribution system remains the same, which means pretty bad, but it has not collapsed. So it still works. It still exists. Uh, I mentioned before that um, the colder temperatures are coming. That's putting more stress on this remaining infrastructure. Uh, so what Ukrainian uh, energy authorities are doing, which very logical and normal, is to extend uh, duration of the uh, this blackouts to preserve uh, this equipment so it doesn't sort of burn out from overuse uh, and then the whole system may collapse so that's where what's happening and you know if temperatures go down significantly more uh, that probably will happen you know even to greater extent so you may see even like 12 hours sort of blackouts or even longer and so on so that's the situation with the Ukrainian energy distribution system now let's actually uh, uh, move to the battlefield and we're gonna do it in a clockwise fashion starting from the north so the situation along the state border is uh, relatively quiet I mean there is ex there are exchanges but of the artillery fire and so on but they are not significant relative to the you know time about months ago uh, now let's jump to the North Luhansk uh, front line and things here don't really change literally attacks and counter attacks in the same places as you can see um, this this sort of north well I guess we call it like northern section or area straight uh, east of um, Kupiansk is becoming pretty active then Ukrainian uh, also uh, troops looking um, uh, uh, to achieve success in the same area here where they try to uh, get to this river uh, cut the road this road is not longer usable anyways in a meaningful way but the whole point is to cut Russian troops in two halves and that and then cross the river and that really will sort of essentially force the hand of the Russian command and they will have to withdraw to the next defensive position which probably probably something like you know it's going to go around Rubizhne and, and so on uh, so uh, again so far no changes in meaning like neither side has any success so this is just uh, I wouldn't call it mid grinder because there's not that level of intensity but just uh, low intensity mid grinder essentially here with no sort of like World War One kind of situation um, and as I mentioned before, the opportunity has been lost uh, for quite, you know, quite a long time ago at this point for Ukrainian side. Uh, now let's actually move to North uh, Donbass uh, front line. So here things also, I mean, the same. Uh, Wagner mercenaries um, doing their like low, like their tactical attacks, um, you know sort of uh, moving ahead at the snail space but eventually it yields some results but so so far no news uh, in terms of any achievements uh, for today uh, now let's uh, move to uh, central Donbass front line things here are also very sort of similar 
no essential differences as you can see you know attacks from the salience with the goal of basically capturing ID uh, Abdivka here which is a relatively uh, I would say important industrial site uh, for Ukraine especially for uh, steel making uh, then unsuccessful attacks in Marinka, Novomikhailivka and this Pavlivka which to great extent is in Russian hands at this point but as I said there is uh, it's essentially a uh, road to nowhere let's put it this way um, and then let's just uh, quickly kind of glance at this whole uh, Zaporizhia front line and this kind of like defensive position uh, along the Dnipro river so here on just quickly look at um, the bridge of front line things are still quiet here uh, the troops have not been sort of moved yet in probably some initial some early units are already on, you know on their way to this front to this section of the front line but uh, the large sort of regrouping is is yet to happen let's put it this way uh, so and then this is situation along the Dnipro River is going to be pretty much quiet in terms of, you know, there is no way for Ukrainian troops to uh, basically establish bridgehead here, and there is no need for this. The, 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 they will look for opportunity uh, on this Zaporizhia front line. As I said before, there are two places uh, for Ukrainian uh, troops. Is one is uh, continue pressuring this North Luhansk and basically slowly and expensively in terms of human lives squeeze out Russian troops out of here which will not do anything will not bring any meaningful result just a squeeze uh, however uh, the Prisia front line offers quite a big price for Ukrainian side uh, and so more probably very likely we'll see some actions here don't know how soon it's going to happen in two weeks three weeks uh i don't know uh, maybe sometime in the, like uh, december uh, yet to be seen but uh, this is the only opportunity that's essentially left uh, for ukrainian side and it's obviously this is totally obvious for the russian command as well so they probably will be redeploying all of this former Hasson bridgehead group to the uh this zaporizhia front line was obviously idea preventing Ukrainian um, uh, offensive there. So this is something that uh, we'll probably see uh, within a month, let's put it this way. Uh, that's all for today. Thanks for watching and until tomorrow. Bye-bye.